Thank you for joining me for worship today. Today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Our order of service begins in the bulletin. We're going to open right now with hymn number 422, Jesus Lead Us On. Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. I now ask you before God who searches the heart, do you confess your sins of thought, word, and deed? Are you sorry for your sins? Do you look to our Savior, Jesus Christ, for forgiveness? And with the Holy Spirit's help, do you want to correct your sinful life? Then declare so by saying, yes. Yes. Upon this confession, I, as a called servant of the word, announce to you God's grace and the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 to 21. In this section, you see the prophet Elijah. He always had a tough job to do, and, and in his frustration, his near despair, well, the Lord basically just says to him, come on, Elijah, let's get going, let's get to work, and, and 
Well, he gets to work, he anoints Elisha, who would be his successor, and, and he anoints others as well. Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Alleluia. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Alleluia. 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 Our epistle reading is from, or our gospel reading rather, is from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. In this section, the Lord Jesus is dealing with some people who wanted to follow him, and he tells them a little bit about the cost of discipleship, that sacrifices are required in, in serving our Savior. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Maybe we can notice that the prophet Elijah seemed to have a similar excuse, but it wasn't really an excuse. He was saying, I'm ready to go. These people in this section, they were making excuses, and Jesus could look into their hearts and see the excuses. And that's why he spoke a little bit more strongly to them. And again, remember, sacrifices are 
required in the service of the Savior, but the blessings are so great when we serve our Savior. Let's sing our next hymn, hymn 465, Jesus I my cross have taken. chapter 5. We're looking at verses 1 and 13 to 25, where the Apostle Paul wrote, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. 
So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not know what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who art our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow free citizens of Christ's kingdom, Every year at the 4th of July, we celebrate something that's so precious and, and valuable to us. I'm talking about the, the freedom that we have in our country. About almost 250 years ago, that's the time of the birth of a free nation. But how much do you know about the, the Declaration of Independence that proclaimed that historic freedom, that historic occurrence. Are you aware, for example, that the official copy of that document, it wasn't signed by the Continental Congress until August the 2nd of 1776, and that at least one of the members of the Congress, Thomas McKean, he didn't add his name to the signatures on that document until 1777. And one of the commi committee members, Robert Livingston, who helped frame this symbol of liberty, he never did end up signing that document. Now, when we think of the Declaration of Independence, it is a document that talks about independence, but when you look at it, really it tells us that that independence is not something that could be gained without dependence upon God. It couldn't be gained without dependence on God. The brave men who initiated it, who signed it, realized basically this thought. Genuine freedom comes only through reliance on the Almighty. And that statement, we'll hear it again. Genuine freedom comes only through reliance upon the Almighty. That sounds so good to us Christians because when we think about reliance upon the Almighty, well, what does that mean to us? That means trusting in Jesus as our Savior from sin, our only Savior from sin. It means knowing that we sinners who deserve eternal punishment because of our sin, well, it means that we're freed from the hell that we deserve because Jesus took care of things for us, because of what Jesus has done for us. Unfortunately, though, all too many people, when they would think of this phrase, Genuine freedom comes only through reliance upon the Almighty. What that means to so many people is not what it means to us as Christians. It means really to so many people that when a person submits to God and 
follows his moral laws as best he can. And those laws, well, to many people, they're subject to change, as we see so much in our world today. Then a person, when he is submitting and trying his hardest, then he can enjoy freedom in this life. And notice, really, that says nothing about Christianity at all, does it? That's humanism. That's the basic religion of human minds. Human minds. Be the best person that you can be, and then you're going to be acceptable to God. But of course, there isn't any real freedom in that, is there? Because being the best person that you can be, it never truly satisfies because a person always has to wonder, well, have I reached the level that I need to reach? And there's that uncertainty, and then there's also the fact that the scriptures tell us that we can never reach a level where we would be on our own, by our works, by our deeds, be acceptable to God. The Apostle Paul, he said, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Thank God that we know that Genuine freedom doesn't come from our efforts to keep God's law from what we do, but true freedom comes through faith in what Christ has done for us. So Paul is encouraging us in our reading today then to, to stand firm in our freedom, our freedom in Christ. And when he talks about that, well, from our reading we'll see we are free from slavery to the law, but we aren't free to sin. And we are free to live by the Spirit. Paul's letter to the Galatian Christians is a letter that can be divided into three basic parts. There's the opening part, the first part in which he stresses that his message comes not from men, but from God. That's the first part. The second part then, he talks about how he gives various proofs to show that salvation is something that is just by the grace of God. It's just by the gift of God's grace and his love and that there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. And now with this chapter here, we're at the beginning of the third part of the book of his letter. And what Paul does is he applies this to our Christian lives. And he says, since Christ has done everything for us and for our salvation, we've been freed from a slavish obedience to God's law to try to earn our way to heaven. And we're instead now free for a life of service to our Savior living as believing children of God. That's what we as children of God are going to want to do. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Oh, freedom, that's something that is such a special word to us citizens of the United States, isn't it? And now to preserve our freedom, what our country is willing to do is send its young men and women into battle to fight to try to preserve that freedom. Imagine what it would be like to live in a country like under Saddam, when, what it was like under Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler in a spot like that where you didn't have the freedoms that we have. We cherish the freedoms that we have in our country. But what Paul wants us to see here, though, what he wants us to see is that freedom from political tyranny is far surpassed by 
the spiritual freedom we have in Christ. And freedom from a guilty conscience, that is far a far greater blessing than freedom from taxation without representation. But the price of freedom is something that requires eternal vigilance on our part, isn't it? Now, Paul, he's encouraging us to stand firm in our freedom, to stick with it, to stay with it, because the fact of the matter is, is that, well, what Christ did for us is something that potentially we could lose out on. We could lose our freedom from the law if instead of trusting solely in what Christ has done for us, we start trusting in our own works or our deeds. And we also have to watch out for, oh, falling to sin, but, but Paul says if we trust in our deeds even a little bit, if we trust in our deeds even a little bit, it makes Christ, he says, of no value to you at all. Trust in our deeds, that's going to condemn us, but then, of course, if we ignore good works, if we ignore serving our Savior, if we don't strive to live as God's believing children, that could cause us to lose our freedom as well. Paul said, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. A temptation that Satan likes to hurl in front of us is the temptation to believe that since we can't earn our way to heaven anyway, and since there is forgiveness, well, see, it doesn't really matter how we live our lives. Such thinking could get a person to believe that he can, well, get drunk or do drugs or cheat on his spouse, view pornography, live alternate lifestyles, disobey the government, not pay our taxes, not be close to God and his word, and just believe that we're forgiven. But that is what Paul's talking about here is indulging the sinful nature. When we are indulging our sinful nature, what we're doing is we're putting our eternal souls at serious risk. Now, it's true that Christians do struggle with sin, and, and oftentimes Christians do end up falling to the same types of sins over and over because we have a particular weakness in a particular area. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that when we would deliberately sin against God, when we would deliberately do what we know God says is wrong, or if we don't care what God says, if we ignore what God says to us in his word, then we are, as he says, indulging the sinful nature. And instead of indulging the sinful nature, we'll want to look to God and his word for help. And we'll want to look to our fellow Christians for help to fight against indulging our sinful nature. We'll want to do also everything that we can to help others, our friends, our family, our acquaintances, to fight against indulging against the sinful nature as well, no matter, no matter what their sin may be as well. Paul says, rather serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Oh, we've all heard people say that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and, and that's really what Paul is talking about here. Our world does not teach us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Our world is teaching us to look out for me, myself, and I, to selfishly think about ourselves. And our world teaches us as we try to climb the business ladder of life that it's okay to knock people off at different times. 
And our world teaches us that if we want something, we should go for it, even if it belongs to someone, even if it's someone else's property or spouse. Well, Paul says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's point here is simple and it's, it's sobering. Whoever chooses to do what is contrary to God's law, he, he's a slave to sin. He needs help fighting against his sinful nature. And even though Christ died to pay for all of his sins, pay for all of his sins, because of his impenitence, because he's not sorry for his sin, because he's continuing in his sin, he's enslaving himself to sin. And as Paul says here, he will not inherit the kingdom of God unless, of course, the Lord leads him to repentance. Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not know what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Oh, some of you have heard me often refer to how I like to with the contrast that's described here, think of Bugs Bunny cartoons. And I think of those Bugs Bunny cartoons in which Bugs Bunny was dealing with a moral dilemma. And when that happened, on one shoulder there would be this little angel Bugs, and on the other shoulder would be this little devil Bugs. And, and in the cartoon, what happens is that they're fighting against each other and trying to lead Bugs Bunny to, well, the angel bugs to do what is right, the devil bugs to do what is wrong. And oftentimes what happens is that the devil bugs in those cartoons would end up winning. And, and the tragic thing is that in our lives, that struggle is something that often goes on. Only thing is, it's not a cartoon. It's not a cartoon. In that battle between our sinful flesh and our new man, our sinful flesh led by Satan and sin, and our new man influenced, led by the Holy Spirit, that battle is always something that's going on in the Christian's life and Unfortunately, what we'd have to recognize is that our sinful nature, the devil bugs, if you want to put it that way, so often ends up winning. But it doesn't have to be that way. Why? Just think about which force is the greater force. You have our sinful nature, it's empowered by, by Satan and you have our new man, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Well, which one is stronger, Satan or the Holy Spirit? The answer, of course, is obvious to us. The fact is, is that our sinful flesh, it doesn't ever have to get the best of us. So as Paul encourages us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Or, or when Paul also says, put on that full armor of God, he encourages us to do that it's, is because it's through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit that we're built up and strengthened in our faith so that we can fight against that sinful nature. Paul said, but the fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit, when the Word of God is working in our hearts, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The story is told of how Abraham Lincoln one day went to a slave auction and he was appalled by how the slave traders and their customers, how they mistreated the human beings who were on the auction block. There was a young man, woman who was put on the auction block who, well, Abraham was, Abraham Lincoln was especially noticing her situation because he could see in her eyes how years of oppression had just shriveled up her soul. And she regarded everyone around her with, with hatred and contempt. And when the bidding began, what Abraham Lincoln did is he made a bid and, and he was outbid and the process went on and on. He'd make a bid and he'd be outbid and finally he ended up winning. And after he gave the auctioneer the cash for the, that slave and took title to her, to that slave woman, Lincoln took the title and what well, she kind of glared at him and was saying, what are you going to do with me now? And his response, I'm going to set you free. The woman was very skeptical at that and she said, free, free for what? And Lincoln said, just free, completely free. And she said, free to do whatever I want? He said, yes. Free to say whatever I want? He said, yes. And she said, free to go wherever I want? And he said, yes, that's right. You may go wherever you want. And with a, she had had this frown and hatred all over her face. And now with a sudden smile on her face, she said, then I'm going with you. And I'm going with you. Having been set free from sin and slavery to the law by our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it our greatest joy to go wherever our Savior goes? To, to follow Him, to serve Him, to strive to do His will. And see now, that's what it really means to stand firm in our freedom in Christ. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray. O God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that, loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. We pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. prayers today, well, please look at our prayer list, look at all of the different people with their different aches and pains and their trials and troubles. As we think of those people, well, we remember Stan Krosick dealing with shingles, we remember Pat Bodell needing some heart valve surgery, we think of Lisa Vanderlee's neighbor who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. We think of Paula Burris dealing with knee and shoulder problems and infections and we think of Roberta Waldron dealing with mini stroke and other health issues and we think of Forrest Ripley dealing with skin cancer needing some surgery at the end of the month. Lord God, when, when we think of these and the other people listed in our prayer list, we say, Lord God, Please be with them, give them your help and strength, and if it's according to your will, grant them healing, but especially grant them more and more of your grace and love, knowing the freedom that we have in Jesus our Savior. And please, again, as we think about the war that's going on in Ukraine, please let there be peace if that's your will. Let there be peace so that there could be more and more of the gospel message reaching out into the world so that more people again can know that freedom in Christ. And, and we gather up all their prayers we have as we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. We'll join in singing our prayer for our country. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Again, thank you for joining me for worship today. Just a couple of announcements. Well, in the congregation this week, Todd Hubert's birthday is on Monday. John and Paula Greathouse have an anniversary on Tuesday. That's also Carmen Nolte's birthday. Wednesday, Gabriel Purdy has a birthday. Lyle Johnson, Thursday. Jean Grinnell on Friday. I've told you about most of the folks in the congregation who 
need your prayers, again, you can look at the prayer list to see the, the full list of those who have different needs. And please keep on praying that we can remain free in freedom. That is, oh, as that phrase said, genuine freedom comes only through reliance on the Almighty. And for us, that means trusting in the Lord Jesus, knowing his grace and love. Lord, bless and keep you always. Amen.